Sejam bem-vindos. Vamos ler capítulos 12 e 13 do livro Uts, o Bruce Chatwin. I am not an expert on Missian porcelain, although my years of trapezing around art museums have taught me what it is. Nor can I say I like Missian porcelain. I do, however, admire the boisterous energy of an artist such as Candler at play with a medium which was totally new. And I entirely side with Utz in his feud with Winkleman, who in his Notes on the Plebeian Taste in Porcelain would supplant this plebeian vitality with the dead hand of classic perfection. I'm equally fascinated by the way in which porcelain sickness, the porcelain rack oich of Augustus the Strong, so warped his vision, and that his ministers, that their delirious schemes for ceramics got confused with real political power, of broil, who would become director of the Museum Manufactory. Horace Walpole commented tartly, he had prepared nothing but baubles against a prince, Frederick the Great, that lived in a camp with the frugality of a common soldier. Hutz had chosen each item to reflect the moods and facets of the porcelain century. The wit, the charm, the gallantry the love of the exotic, the heartlessness and light-hearted gaiety, before they were swept away by revolution and the tramp of armies. Capitula Trezi. Arranged along the longest set of shelves were plates, vases, flagons and tureens. There were tea caddies of polished redware by the inventor of porcelain, Jonas Botka. There were botchka tank yards with silver gilt mounts, teapots with watel scenes, teapots with eagle-headed spouts and teapots painted with goldfish after Chinese and Japanese models. Utz came up behind me, breathing heavily. Beautiful, no? Beautiful, I repeated. He showed me an excellent example of Indianesque Blumen and a turquoise bowl painted by Hordolt with a panel of Augustus enthroned as the Emperor of China. He showed me the Messian imitations of Qiang Hao, the blue and the white, the porcelain his hero Augustus had loved so passionately, for which he had emptied his treasury to the dealers of Paris and Amsterdam, causing his Ministry of Industry, Graf van Triskenhaus, to moan, China is the bleeding bowl of Saxony. Pride of place, however, was given to a swan service tureen, a rococo fantasy on legs of intertwined fishies, the handles in the form of neuroids, the lid heaped high with flowers, shells, swans, and a bug-dyed dolphin, which, for the bravura of its execution, would have been a monstrosity. I gasped, knowing that the way to endear oneself to an art collector is to rhapsodize his things. Come, he beckoned me across the room. I picked my way around the pelican and the rhino and arrived at the second bank of shelves where, in rows of five and six, were assembled a multitude of 18th century figurines, all dazzling, clothed and coloured. I saw the characters of the Commedio del Arch, Harlequin, a Columbine, Brigella and Pantaloon, Scaramouche et Trophologine, the doctor with a corkscrew for a beard, the captain who, being Spanish, had a jet black moustache. Which reminded me how the Italian players, the real ones, had been masters of extorpor, who would decide what to play and how to play it, a mere five minutes before the curtain rose. He pointed to the personification of the continents, Africa in leopard skin, America in feathers, Asia in a pagoda hat, while a lascivious, broad bottom Europa sat astride a white horse. Next came the ladies of the court, 
Ladies with frozen smiles and swaying crinkle lines. Their wigs were powdered, their cheeks pocked with beauty spots, and there were black bows tied around their necks. One lady caressed a pug, one kissed a Polish nobleman, another kicks kissed a Saxon while Harlequin peeped up her skirt. Madame G. Pompidor, in a lilac dress, scattered with roses, sang the Aurea from Lula's Asis y Galanti, which she had sung in real life with the Prince of Rohan for a partner in the Petit Théâtre de Versailles. The lower orders were represented, each according to his or her occupation, the miner, the rope maker, the woodcutter, the seamstress, the hairdresser, and a fisherman hopelessly drunk. Shepherds trilled at their flutes. A Turk puffed a hooker. There were Tatars, Malabars, Circassians, and Chinese sages with wispy beards and songbirds perched on their fingers. A party of Freemasons scrutinized the globe. A pilgrim bore his staff and scalloped shell, and an endlessly grieving Master de la Rosa sat next to a disconsolate man. Bravo, I cried. Unbelievable. Now look at these funny fellows, Utz was stroking the cheek of a grotesque buffoon. This one is Court Jester Frolich. That one is Postmaster Schmelge. The two clowns used to perform at royal banquets and keep everyone in stitches all night. Utz thought them as funny in porcelain as they were supposed to have been in real life. Schmelge, he said, was terrified of mice. This was why he chose to portray the court jester in the act of teasing his friend with a mouse trap. Candler, he sniggered, was a witty man, a satirical man. He was always choosing persons to laugh at. I forced a nervous laugh. Now, sir, if you please, look at this one. The modern question showed the soprano, Faust in Faustini Bourdon, Seen in ecstasy while a fox sat playing a spinet. Fuschino, he said, had been the Calais of her day and wife of the court composer Hassi. She also had a lover called Fuchs. Fuchs, said Utz, you must know in German means fox. I do know. That is very amusing, no? Very, I laughed. Good, we agree on that one then. He let fly an unexpectedly loud crackle and went on shaking with laughter until Marta returned with a canopies and with another hair baron silenced him. The moment her back was turned, he re-entered his world of little figures. His face lit up. He grinned, displaying, displaying a set of unhealthy pink gums and showed me his monkey musicians. Lovely ones, aren't they? Lovely, I assented. The monkeys wore cuffs and powdered wigs, and under the baton of tyrannical conductor in a blue swallow-tailed coat were fiddling and scraping, trumpeting, strumming and singing, in mockery of Count Brühl's private orchestra. I, Utz boasted, am the only private collector to possess the whole set. Good for you, I said encouragingly. Finally, we passed from the monkeys to the rest of the Menjoa, where there were guagtails, partridges, a bittern, a pair of swat sparrowhawks, parrots and parakeets, aurelius, a roller birds, and peacocks displaying their tail feathers. I counted a camel, a chamois, an elephant, a crocodile, and a limpizania led by a negro. Count Brule's favourite pug dog, sat curled on a rose velvet cushion while, on the bottom shelf, like a large albino fish, lay the life-size horse's tail in which porcelain intended, or so it said, for an equestrian statue of Augustus to be erected at the Judahof in Dresden. He then removed one of his seven figures of Harlequin, the Harlequin his grandfather gave him as a boy and turning it upside down, pointed to the crossed swords, Mark of Mizane, and to an inventory label with a number and letter in code. 
This was the label that marked the piece for the museum. But those persons, Utz whispered, have made a mistake. So that's the end of uh, chapter 13. I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, until the next time, take care.